persecution. Deportation and forcible transfer. Applicable law. Deportation and forcible transfer of non-Serb civilians, including Croats and Muslims, form the basis of three of the accounts mentioned in the indictment. Uh, on the one hand, the prosecution include these crimes under account one persecution. On the other hand, the prosecution also qualifies uh, a deportation as a constituting a crime against humanity, uh, count 10, uh, and inhumane act constituting a crime against humanity, forcible transfer, count 11. The prosecution alleges in paragraph 31 to 33 of the indictment uh, that the accused planned, instigated, committed, or otherwise aided and abetted the planning, preparation, and commission of the crimes of ex uh, deportation, forcible transfer of non-civilian Serbs, namely Croats and Muslims, between the 1st of August 91 and the months of May 1992, in the autonomous region of Croatia and the RSK, between the 1st of March 1992 and of September 1993 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and between May and August 1992 in certain areas of Vojvodina. The jurisprudence of this tribunal makes a distinction between deportation punishable under Article 5D of the statute and forcible transfer punishable under Article 5.1 of the statute under the qualification other inhumane acts. For uh, those people interested in uh, this uh, question, this distinction was made in the Kerstic judgment of the 2nd of August 2001, in which uh, the, the, uh, first, the trial chamber stated in paragraph 521 that um, both deportation and forcible transfer related to the involuntary and an unlawful evacuation of individuals from the territory in which they reside. Uh, Yet the two are not synonymous in customary international law. Deportation presumes a transfer beyond state borders, whereas forcible transfer relates to displacements within a state. This a distinction, however, does not mean that this should not be unanimously condemned as a practice under international humanitarian law. In addition, jurisprudence has evolved in this uh, uh, respect, uh, and uh, the uh, transborder nature of transfer has been more closely addressed. The trial chamber in the Stakic case um, held that deportation required the crossing of uh, borders, but this could take on different forms. So the appeals chamber, in its uh, appeal judgment of the 22nd of March 2006, uh, uh, rec uh, recalled that international customary law uh, implicitly admits that the victims must be uh, driven out into another country beyond uh, the officially recognized borders, and that displacement uh, outside a, an occupied territory is enough to qualify for deportation. It uh, therefore inferred that under certain circumstances, displacements uh, beyond the borders could de facto constitute deportation. According to uh, the constant uh, case law of the tribunal, the material element of deportation is constituted by the fact uh, that people are displaced by force or by some other means of co coercion from the area in which they legally re reside beyond uh, the official frontiers of a state or, in certain cases, beyond a de facto front frontier in the absence of grounds admitted under international law. However, as far as uh, uh, mens rea is concerned and the need to prove the intention of the accused to drive out uh, the victims permanently, the jurisprudence of the tribunal remains unclear. Uh, as regards uh, the forced nature of transfer or deportation, it is important to uh, recall the jurisprudence of the tribunal that this is not restricted to the use of physical force, uh, but can also involve a threat resorting to force or co coercion. 
that it may be in the form of violence, duress, detention, psychological pressure, misuse of power, or that it can merely be the consequence of a climate of coercion. And it is only to determine whether the person transferred really had the choice or not, it is important to view this in the light of the circumstances of each case. As far as the lawfulness of transfer or deportation is concerned, the Geneva Convention allow for a forced displacement in very specific cases. Article 19 of the Third Geneva Convention relating to the treatment of uh, prisoners of war, authorize the evacuation of prisoners of war from a combat zone, and the combat zone in the direction of camps where they will be out of danger. Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention on the protection of uh, civilians in wartime authorizes a total or partial evacuation of an occupied area. Let me quote, if the security of the, of the population or compelling military uh, reasons so require. That said, uh, the population will have to be brought back home as soon as the hostilities cease in the area. And lastly, Article 17 of the second uh, uh, additional protocol admits uh, that the displacement of uh, the civilian population may be ordered for uh, conflict related uh, on conflict related grounds uh, furthermore the consent of the displaced people can justify that displacement and make it le legal that said uh, the consent must be given voluntary and the person must give it of his own free will in paragraph 17 I of the indictment, the accused Cheshire is charged with persecution punishable under Article 5H of the statute for the deportation or, trans or forcible transfer of tens of thousands of non-Serb civilians, including Croats and Muslims, uh, more specifically in Zvornik, uh, in the area of Sarajevo, Mostar, Nevesinje, and in certain uh, areas of Vojvodina. On several occasions, uh, the trial chambers uh, admitted that forced displacement of the population constituted persecution. The forced nature of the displacement uh, incur the responsibility of the person committing that act uh, and not the the destination or place where these people are sent. Uh, this uh, element can be assessed uh, along the same standards as those applied to the crimes of forcible transfer and deportation punishable under Articles 5D and 5I of the Statute. Uh, for the acts of deportation and forcible transfer to be considered as underlying acts to the crime of persecution, they must have been committed separately or cumulatively and have been committed with a discriminatory intent and constitute the crime of prosecution of the same gravity as the other crimes um, mentioned in Article 5 of the statute. At this stage, I shall not rule on the question of whether I should expand on the question of deportation or forcible transfer as an underlying act of, of prosecution under Count 1, since I concluded above in light of uh, the evidence uh, uh, received on the existence of count one. The essential question which remains is to know whether a public authority may or not uh, uh, call for the displacement of its population. Uh, the Prot uh, additional Protocol 2 of the Geneva Convention of 1994 relating to the protection of victims um, during non-international non-international 
armed conflicts on the 8th of June 1977, quotes in its Article 17, the displacement of the civilian population cannot be ordered for reasons relating to a conflict. Otherwise, unless the security of the civilians uh, or compelling uh, military reasons uh, so require. Uh, should such displacements have to be carried out, all possible measures shall be taken so that the civilian population may be received under satisfactory conditions of shelter, hygiene, health, safety, and nutrition. Civilians shall not be compelled uh, to leave their own territory for reasons connected with the conflict. The ICRC commentary in this case says uh, that displacement of the civilian population shall not be ordered unless the security of the civilians so uh, demand or imperative, imperative military reasons so demand, therefore to exceptional circumstances. I believe that these reasons have to be appraised on a case-by-case -case basis and that in any event there must be imperative, imperative reasons. Therefore, by looking into the speeches as we are going to do in a moment, I did not find in uh, the utterances uh, by the accused either of these two circumstances. Let me now review the evidence on record with regard to transfer and deportation. And as I did before, I'm going to examine uh, the evidence year by year in order to see this in a timeline. 1990. The, in the accused uh, gave an interview to a weekly, the uh, Serb uh, weekly Pogledi, on the 15th of April 1990. He calls for the displacement of the entire Albanian population living within a 50-kilometer area uh, from uh, the Albanian border to other places in Yugoslavia, and uh, recalls that the Albanian ethnic minority supported uh, by the West threatens the majority Serb ethnic population. 1991. On the 11th of May 1991, he gave uh, an interview to uh, TV Novi Sad and said that all the Albanians had to be deported from Serbia. Exhibit P1254. Several months later, in an interview to a Ratne Novine journalist on the 24th of November 91. He speaks in favor of a population in change, suggesting that the Serbs from Zagreb should go to Župania and that the Croats from Župania should go to settle in Zagreb, because in his view, Croats and Serbs cannot cohabit, live together within one and the same state. I insist. He said that the Serbs and Croats could not live together within one and the same state. Exhibit P1186. The following year, in 1992, he gave an interview to a Radio Novisa journalist, reporter, on 16th of January 1992, and he called for a population exchange between Serbs and Croats which should be done as soon as possible, in his view. Exhibit P1190. On the 5th of April 1992, he gave an interview to a political journalist and spoke in favor of a population exchange between Serbs and Croats. Exhibit P1298. In an interview to a journalist of the Unity Serb Daily, I spoke about it already, but this was on the 21st of April 1992, he urged the 500,000 Albanian migrants to go back to Albania. Uh, 11, uh, exhibit P1197. In questions during a press conference 
held by the SRS on the 28th of May 1992, the accused stated that uh, the disloyal Croats should be ousted from Croatia, deported from Croatia, and that the Serb refugees should actually take their place in uh, the dwellings that they would have left. Exhibit P1199. On the 12th of June 1992, He stated to TV Politica that there was going to be an exchange population between Serbs and Croats, Exhibit P-1201. In an interview to a Globus journalist on the 7th of August, 1992, he explained that when the SIS uh, was in power, he it would carry out a population exchange between Serbs and Croats. Exhibit P-1203. In a debate organized by the Tanyuk News Agency on the 7th of December 1992, he called for uh, the deportation of the 360,000 uh, Albanian migrants and their offsprings who had entered uh, Kosovo Metohja or more widely Yugoslavia since the 6th of April 1941. Exhibit P-1208. Let's move to 1993. Sorry for speeding up. My apologies to the interpreters, but since they are excellent, they're able to keep pace with me. In a radio interview uh, to Radio Banja Luka, 20th of March 1993, he said that the SRS had um, worked to accommodate Serb refugees in abandoned flats. He said uh, that there should be a campaign for a population exchange between Serbs, Muslims, and Croats, who no longer can, according to him, live together in the same territory, Exhibit P-1215. In a radio interview to Radio Belgrade, Belgrade on the 22nd of March, 1993. He explained that Dobritsak Čosic, president of the FRI, called for a population exchange between Serbs and Croats, and that the SRS uh, was fully committed to make it happen. Exhibit P-1216. In an interview, the source of which is not specified, but it is mentioned in one of his books, the accused This is Exhibit P-1218. So on the 7th of May 1993, he said that there was a spontaneous population exchange in Zvornik, whereby the Serbs took the place of the former Muslim inhabitants. inhabitants. On the 4th of November 1993, speaking to Radio Ponos, he called for a population exchange. Exhibit P-1231. On the 6th of December 1993, speaking to a Tanyuk journalist, he admitted that he had held propaganda speeches for the population to leave Serbia. Document uh, P-574 of 20th of September. Uh, from uh, the Republic of Serbia noted that during the 2002 census there were 56,546 civilians living in the uh, autonomous province of uh, Vodina, whilst Uh, according to the 1991 census, uh, there were 74,808 of them, and that therefore there were uh, 18,262 less civilians. Uh, that is a reduction of uh, to 24.41%. And this document shows that this uh, reduction results from the policy of persecution against a civilian population, which can amount to a war crime. This document might be such as to support the prosecution's allegation as to a policy of persecution that led to the transfer and deportation of non-Serbs. 
In paragraph 11 of uh, their pretrial brief, the prosecution said that the speeches by the accused became more and more virulent towards the uh, Serbian Croats. Exhibits P35, P892, P43. Uh, it said that uh, he, the accused said that once there would have been uh, um, mi- thousands of federal officials deported, uh, thousands of uh, dwellings would have become available in Belgrade. This refers explicitly uh, to the departure of uh, officials from the federal structures of the former Yugoslavia. There's also an allusion to population exchanged, uh, speaking about Serbs deported from Zagreb. And these are classic uh, retaliation measures in international law, basically saying, we're not going to kill you, of course, but we're going to make uh, sure that you get on board trucks and on trains bound for Zagreb. P892. In document P43, admitted that he would deport Croats for several reasons, because they're not faithful to Serbia, they destabilized the domestic situation, they turned out to be direct Ustasha collaborationists, and finally, because they must be the target of retaliation measures after the deportation of 160,000 Serbs by Tujman. As to the issue which is at the very core of the problem, this was the question. You were criticized because you said uh, that all the uh, Croats had to be deported from Serbia. And therefore, it, and it's not in the SRS tradition to, uh, to say so. And so that question is put in, but he doesn't really answer it. He just uh, says uh, that uh, the SRS will tackle the problem uh, at the root of the course. And the person asking the questions does realize that they don't don't get the answer they uh, wish for. And he says, now, how are you going to withdraw what you said about the Croats? And then the accused said, never, ever. Is such an answer directly connected to deportation or to the arguments by Croats who deported Serbs? In this respect, I do not have an absolute certainty. I do have a doubt. When Ms. Tabo testified in support of her report on the emigration of Croats and other non-Serb population uh, from the Hrtkovci village in 1992, there was a list of Croats who left uh, that place in 1992, P565, uh, the destination being Croatia or a known destination. I mentioned that Uh, last time. Uh, the migration of the Hrtkovci population, in her view, was confirmed by information gathered uh, by uh, the Office for Displaced uh, Persons and uh, Refugees established by the Croatian authorities. The latter uh, was to uh, count the arrivals and assess uh, their situation to see that they were entitled to the status of displaced persons and possibly uh, to be uh, given a registration number each. Um, This is uh, transcript page uh, 10842. Witness VSO61 said that um, Baptism certificates were given to Croats leaving at Hofstede so that they could move and cross over to Croatia. Transcript pages 9930, 9931, 9937, 9954. A, tri- a reasonable trial fact could therefore find that among the 722 names listed, uh, there are in fact 233 of them uh, with unknown destination and they have to be taken out of that list. Finally, a reasonable trier of fact who might decide to find the accused guilty for the crime of deportation and forcible transfer in Hrtkovce between 1992 and 1993 can only find him guilty on the basis of the deportation or transfer of 489 individuals in Annex 11 of the indictment. 
based on the evidence, a reasonable trial of facts might find that the accused has committed crimes of deportation and forcible transfer as defined in counts 10 and 11 of the indictment. I'm just about done as far as the D chapter. Now let's move to uh, aiding and abetting. Regarding the mode of responsibility connected to aiding and abetting, the prosecution in paragraphs 149, 150, 151, 152, and 153 of its preliminary of its preliminary brief uses a, a large amount of uh, jurisprudence in its footnotes, 507 to 513, Alechkovsky, Kornulak, Kunarach, Blaskic, Furunjija, Tadic, Selebici, and Vasilievich to state that aiding and abetting means providing help, encouragement, or moral support to the person committing the crime. The case law says that the act of an accused must have an important or significant effect on the perpetration of the crime. Aiding and abetting can be done before, during, or after the crime. The presence of the accused may constitute a form of aiding and abetting if it had an effect on the physical perpetrator. The mens rea must have two aspects. First, the accused must be aware that the commission of the crime is foreseeable, and the accused must know that his acts will contribute to the commission of the crime by the physical perpetrator. According to the prosecution in paragraph 153, the, element, the mens rea is proved by his own uh, statements, P644, the inflammatory nature of his speeches, his repeated visits to the battlefield, and the fact that he relentlessly sent volunteers on the front. Witness VS17. By his orders sent to the volunteers and other Serbian forces, witnesses VS007, VS026, and VS027. And the omission of uh, taking any sanctions against volunteers whenever crimes were committed. VS-007, VS-026, and VS-034. Therefore, it seems uh, that aiding and abetting result from uh, the words uttered by the accused, but the fact that he was present before the on the on the um, battlefield before the combat and sending volunteers. In the indictment, there are three regions: Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, and Serbia. Now you have to relocate the crimes in these regions. Put them back into perspective in these two regions with two main dates in mind, the Declaration of Independence of Croatia and the Declaration of Independence of Bosnia-Herzegovina. These two dates are extremely important because their effect was that the JNA was withdrawn and was replaced by local forces or by armed groups which came from regional entities. So the question now is whether Serbia actually controlled the troops on the ground. The control by Serbia of on Serbian forces, in, as the case law of the tribunal you know, is concerned, must be a global control. With the control of military operations and not just a, mili a financial support. In paragraph 137 of the Tadic uh, uh, appeals judgment, this is what the... Um, with what was said, the control required by international law may be deemed to exist when a state has a role in organizing, coordinating, or planning the military actions of the military group. In addition to financing, training, and equipping, or providing operational support to that group. We still have 10 minutes before the break. Judge Latanzi, even more, actually, because uh, we resumed at 4.25. Bon. Madame Latanzi. Judge Latanzi says we still have 20 minutes, and I thank her for that. <laughs> Regarding overall control, the International Court of Justice in the Appeals Judgment, application of the Convention for the Re Prevention and Repression of Crimes of uh, Genocide, Bosnia-Herzegovina versus Serbia-Montenegro, 
A world known uh, appeals judgment dated February 26, 2007 concluded that Serbia did not have an overall control over the soldiers of the VRS because the VRS was not a de jure organ of the uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in the sense that did not have under its domestic law the status of organ of this one. In paragraph 392 and following of this appeals judgment this is what the uh, this is what is said by the international court of justice i will read slowly because this is important uh, according to the court's jurisprudence uh, persons groups of persons or entities may for purpose of international responsibility be equated with state organs even if that status does not follow from internal law, provided that, in fact, the persons, groups, or entities act in complete dependence, I quote, complete dependence on the state of which they are ultimately merely the instrument. Next paragraph. It's also absolutely essential. At the relevant time, July 1995, Neither the Republika Srpska nor the VRS could be regarded as mere instruments through which the FRY was acting and as lacking any real autonomy. While the political, military, and logistical relation between the federal authorities in Belgrade and the authorities in Palais between the Yugoslav army and the VRS had been strong and close in the previous years, and these ties undoubtedly remained powerful. They were, at least until, at least at the relevant time, not such that the Bosnian Serbs political and military organization should be equated with organs of the FRY. The judges of the ICJ, in order to reach this conclusion, this essential conclusion, were provided with the judgments and the documents of this tribunal. Therefore, this is the question now. If Serbia does not have overall control over the soldiers of VRS, how could a political opponent such as Mr. Sheschel have such a control? Therefore, the accused is uh, charged for having aided in a and aided and abetted uh, the commission of all crimes on counts 1 to 14 by contributing individually and in full awareness. But this uh, mode of liability is extremely broad and must be examined and reviewed for each count. It is important to establish at least that between the, cr among the, between the crimes committed and the accused there's some kind of nexus out of his behavior and his speeches. Firstly, there is no evidence uh, as far as count 4, murder, Counts 8 and 9, torture and inhuman and cruel treatment, and counts 12, 14, 12 to 14, wanted discretion and plunder. In his, through his behavior and his speech, the prosecution does not establish beyond any reasonable doubt that he aided and abetted those who actually committed the murders, tortures, plunders, or looting. Contrary to this, uh, in uh, Exhibit P644, and I think Mr. Markison should read it, uh, it is a key uh, pr prosecution evidence. Uh, well, it pr shows uh, that uh, all these counts are condemned by the accused himself in March 1995. This is what he said. There were incidents. And we were extremely strict on the front line. We immediately dismissed these people. These policemen and Arkans men started to ransack the town. It was a large-scale plunder. When half of the operation was over, in Zvornik, they started to plunder. They even looted the Serbs. It's uh, Commander Arkin who organized this cleansing of Muslims. And he is using the word cleansing. These Muslims were killed. 
And the regime does not want to disclose anything about this. Those who killed them came from Belgrade. Regarding Biliena, he says, Arkin was under the control of Karzic, or under the control of the Serbian army, and later under the orders of Blagojevich. He was prevented from playing any role because he had committed the plunder in Bielina. He had 15 men over there. The situation there was difficult because there, was, there were many crimes. And then I quote one last sentence, which is also essential. This is what he says. Ethnic cleansing was I have to intervene once again, even though I don't do it gladly. Could you please uh, be more precise when it comes to Arkan? I think that the interpretation into Serbian and interpretation into English um, were the opposite of what I said. I said that Arkan could not be under the control either Karadzic or the Serbian army or Blagovic. And it was interpreted as though Arkan was under their control. I didn't hear the French original very well, but I would like you to repeat that sentence if possible, and then we should check the original. Arkan was beyond anyone's control. This is what I meant. Uh, this is what I said, um, uh, as far as I can remember. Very well. We will uh, look at document P644 in detail. Unless uh, there was a mistake in translation, this is what was said. But in French, it says, it's alleged that you would have said, Arkin was, was under the control of Karadzic, or under the control of the Serbian army, and later under the orders of Blagojevic. Blagovic. There might be a mistake, but this is what is on the paper I'm reading. Then what, this last sentence, which is the most important, this is what you would allegedly would have said, unless there was an error, of course. And giving the reference of the document, it's a video, 02.45.59. This is what you would have said. Ethnic cleansing was not organized, but of course, there's, there have been here and there certain events where some form of ethnic cleansing occurred. This is what you said. However, counts 1, 10, and 11 can fall under the liability of the accused regarding aiding and abetting through the inflammatory nature of his speech. Consequently, the accused should be acquitted of aiding and abetting for counts 4, 8, 9, 12 to 14 and could, I'm now saying could and not should, could be found guilty as uh, evidence uh, stands now for counts 1, 10, and 11, subject to no evidence of the contrary being adduced by the accused during the presentation of his case. I have one last chapter on the counts. Counts 1, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And I intended to detail them. I wanted to run uh, through them one after the other. Count one, for example, persecution. I was saying non-Serb civilian population from territories of the SAOS, BS, SBWS, etc., etc. I based myself on the preliminary brief to make a list of all this. But uh, I th 
believe uh, that this is not fundamental, but what is absolutely fundamental, and I will ask Mr. Usher to help us, could he please place on the Elmo my conclusion to know exactly where I would enter an acquittal and where if possibly given uh, the evidence seduced and so on as a reasonable judge and beyond any other any uh, reason beyond any reasonable doubt I could find you guilty according to under rule 98 bis this is appendix 13 now given all the elements to do so far you would be acquitted regarding planning on counts 1, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, regarding instigating, acquitted on counts 4, 8, 9, 12, 13, and 14, regarding ordering, acquitted on counts 1, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, regarding committing, I would enter a judgment of acquittal since I did not uh, retain uh, the JCE, I would acquit you for one, two, and three of the JCE. And for aiding and abetting, you would be acquitted on counts four, eight, nine, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Conclure. I shall now show you Annex 14, which is a summary table of what I admit based on the evidence provided by the prosecution. Notwithstanding what you will say during your defense case, Based on all the evidence uh, adduced, uh, I would like to say as far as instigation is concerned, I could uh, enter a conviction of a guilty for persecution, counts 10 and 11, deportation and forcible transfer for the material commission. I could enter a conviction of guilt under counts 1, 10, and 11 for uh, deportation and forced, uh, forcible transfer. And as regards aiding and abetting, I could also admit uh, counts 1, persecution, 10, and 11, deportation, and forcible transfer. I must. Uh, or I lastly have the duty to say, as you can see on the screen, that uh, for the time being, I have admitted uh, the following forms of instigation. These are forms of responsibility. Instigating, aiding and abetting, committing, based on the evidence adduced. Uh, but uh, at the time of the judgment, uh, it will be important to admit only one form of responsibility for either the accused uh, committed, either he instigated, <coughs> or he aided and abetted. In my view, it can only be an either-or situation. You can't be an instigator, accomplice, and perpetrator all at once. Uh, this concludes uh, my opinion. All of, this is, all of this is very complicated in technical terms. Uh, I fully agree with the trial chamber as regards persecution through instigation instigating, com committing and aiding and abetting. However, I totally disagree about the fact, and I also agree on the count relating to forcible transfer and deportation. I fully agree with the majority of the chamber as regards counts 1, 10, and 11, and uh, the chamber in its majority held uh, that all the other counts needed to be addressed. 
there is a diverging view on this matter. Like my colleagues, I'm in favor of uh, the continuance of the trial, and I dismiss your motion for grounds that differ from the grounds put forward by my colleagues. We now have to make a break, which is a 60-minute break. Uh, these are for technical reasons. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. I'm sorry. We shall resume in 30 minutes' time. And in 30 minutes' time, I will tell Mr. Sheshel how we uh, proceed further.